Schools in the U.S. are enrolling more and more children who speak a language other than English at home. Right here in the suburbs of Philadelphia, for instance, there's a high school teacher we know who teaches English to a class of about 30 students who have 13 different native languages among them. 13 in one class. And one of our other faculty members used to teach at a school in L.A. that counted 83 different native languages spoken among its students. Imagine teaching in one of those schools and all the wonderful opportunities and challenges that that sort of language diversity brings to the classroom. This is the Penn GSE EdCast, where you get perspectives on education and social science from the University of Pennsylvania's Graduate School of Education. I'm your host, Tom Ketchkamethi, and today we're talking about multilingual education with Dr. Nancy Hornberger. Nancy's a professor here who works in our educational linguistics program. She focuses a lot of her time and her work on bilingual and multilingual education and the policies and teaching approaches that best serve language minority children. She argues against English-only approaches to education, contending that languages children bring to the classroom are a resource that we must appreciate, cultivate, and learn from in order to help them become full members of a democratic society. In terms of multilingual education policy worldwide, I think that always what stands out to me when, when that question is posed is sort of two simultaneous uh, trends that in some ways pull apart, but coexist. So what I'm getting at is the trend toward global languages, and English is certainly a big player in that you know, arena, and simultaneously the trend toward more recognition for local languages or indigenous languages, particularly indigenous languages, but also any kind of locally meaningful, often minoritized language. By minoritized, we mean languages that may not necessarily be numerically a minority, but are minoritized in a political sense. They're not recognized in formal official contexts or haven't been. But what I'm getting at with multilingual education policy is that both of these things are happening. There's increasing demand and government attention to helping learners in their educational systems have access to global languages, and especially English. So you see that in all of the Asian countries, lots of attention to the teaching of English from elementary school on up, and in some cases requiring it as a medium of instruction, which poses all sorts of great challenges to teachers who may not be that fluent in English or certainly may not have a lot of preparation to teach through the medium of English. So that's a policy issue that's coming up all over the world. Simultaneously, this recognition of the importance of local, especially indigenous languages. So you have in Scandinavia for the last 20, 30 years, there's been ever increasing attention to Sami speakers, the speakers of the Sami languages in Finland, Sweden, Denmark, Norway, and parts of Russia. Those countries have actually taken some of the most creative policy approaches in recognizing the indigenous rights of the peoples, like having their own parliament, having their own government systems, and then also incorporating Sami languages into the schools as medium of instruction, but also as a, a second language for you know people who aren't speakers of the language. So how do you square these two megatrends? If these are the two megatrends, you know that that there is increasingly an international language of you know sur- survival in a global economy, business, etc., and that being English, with a, a resurgence of valuing indigenous languages. How do you square the value of those two? They're not necessarily competing trends, are they? They're not. How you square them is through multilingual education. So you kind of abandon the idea that education has to be carried out through the medium of only one language, which has been a model that's been held sway sort of since the beginnings of public education or universal primary education that actually doesn't go that far back. It's kind of more with the rise of nationalism in Europe in the 19th century and the establishment of new nations in Asia and Africa in the 20th century that there's this ideology of like one language, one nation, that we have to have, you know, a common language in order to have a common nation. And I think if we can sort of move beyond that and recognize that, yes, it's useful to have a common language that can be a what we call a lingua franca across different language groups, that doesn't mean that we only have to speak that language. We can also speak other languages. We can be bilingual, trilingual, multilingual. 
And the value of that is that for those minoritized languages and the children who are growing up in their homes, let's say, speaking a language other than the national common language, for them to have the opportunity to start learning in their own language is invaluable for their educational success. And we've seen that in research all over the world, including in the U.S. I think it's easy, perhaps easier for people like me to see Single, lang- single language policy or dominant language policy, valuing that as, you know, not kind of necessarily a national good. I mean, everybody speaking the same language does something for uh, a nation. It does something for commerce. It does something for ease of communication. It does something for business. It does something, you know, I mean, it, it seems like just ease of use, right, that there is an argument to be made for that. But what you just said was that multilingual education is much, much better for the kids, right? So tell me a little bit about why. I think that this is the thing that a lot of people don't understand. My own research has focused mostly at the classroom and community level. And when one can see learners thriving in their classroom and communities thriving as participants in a national society, it's kind of easy to extrapolate from there to think about how they're going to be much more able to participate in a democratic society as actors who are part of the community, of the national community, without being you know, shoved aside and, and uh, marginalized. I think everyone pretty much recognizes that the U.S. is a immigrant society. If we think of what we lose when we don't enable those immigrants to contribute to our society, you know, for me it becomes very clear what the nation loses when we don't invite immigrants, who are by definition mostly speakers of other languages, into our educational system in ways that help them succeed. The, we have so many problems in our educational systems um, in the U.S. today. And it's not even just in the U.S., around the world, when you find the groups that are not doing well in schools, they're always, I think I could go so far as to say, they're always the groups who are coming into school speaking a language other than the dominant language of the society. Yeah, so what is the answer? And this goes to the question that you put very succinctly on on your own website. What educational approaches best serve language minority children? Well, it's the, I gloss it in this, you know, overall category called multilingual education. But one of the important things to realize about multilingual education is that it's not just one thing. So in every context, there's probably a, a good way to do it that might be different from another context. So it could be in the a case of Maori speakers in New Zealand, for example, that's the, the large indigenous group in New Zealand. So it's a fairly homogeneous in the sense that there are a lot of, I mean, the the language involved is a language Maori. And you can think about having programs that recognize that language, bring it into education, while also teaching the kids English. But in another context where there's multiple, you know, what many people today are calling super diverse learners, um, you know, in areas just outside Philadelphia, for example, or even or in Philadelphia where you have, you know, a classroom with kids from 35 different language backgrounds or whatever, you can't, you know, just have a bilingual program that uses two languages of instruction. But there you can have approaches that, in a classroom context, enable learners to draw on their language repertoires. We, we think of the, you know, kids, of, of all of us as having... Um, a repertoire of linguistic resources that we draw on. Even people that think they're monolingual speakers actually have different registers and styles and varieties of their language that they're drawing on for different contexts, whether it's home or school or whatever. And so in those cases, you can have pedagogies that, let's say, if you have a couple of speakers of one language, they can do pair work for a while in their language, and then that kind of provides the foundation for them to then contribute to the class in English. Or if you don't even have, you know, two speakers of the same language, you can have language awareness kinds of activities where there's an openness for kids to share, you know, oh, this is how I say it in my home, or, you know, they make connections with each other's um, expressions and uh, meanings. And it's not just also, you know, the word, what they say, but kind of the cultural um, layers that that are under those terms and words. So a lot of it has to do with just simply an openness and an, a 
sense of acceptance of the resources that kids bring with them. That's one level of multilingual education. In terms of a policy approach, I've had the opportunity to work internationally in contexts like you mentioned, Bolivia and New Zealand and Sweden and Paraguay and South Africa, which in the 90s have all had these stunning educational policies that talk about the value of all the languages in the national community and, you know, explicitly set out teacher preparation and uh, curriculum and materials development and so forth. So that creates what I've written about as an ideological and implementational space for, you know, multilingual education practice. But you can also have contexts like the U.S. where there isn't that kind of policy space. The policy in the U.S. recently has been going in the opposite direction. But even there we find teachers at the classroom level that are able to carve out some space even within sort of an English-only language policy. It's hard, though, it is, and it's getting increasingly harder. So that's the part that people in, in this field in the U.S. are concerned about to put it mildly. So if you had that state or federal policy maker as your captive audience for 15 minutes to kind of make the case who is considering a, a, a more expansive kind of multilingual education policy, and, and you had uh, 15 or 20 minutes of their undivided attention to sort of make the case for why they should be going in that direction from a policy perspective, what would the case be? The case would be that if we're seeking to educate or offer equal educational opportunity to all in our national territory, and we want to build a knowledgeable and democratic society that's very inclusive, then we want our learners from the first day they step into the door at school to feel welcome and to be able to understand what's going on and to be able to build on the knowledge that they have when they come in since we know from research that one way that really helps that to happen is to speak to children in their own language and let them use the linguistic resources, as I said, that they bring to the classroom, then let's do that. That's going to improve their academic performance. It's going to build and uh, solidify their sense of identity and personhood, like, you know, to be active citizens in the world. Let me give you an example from the conference this weekend, the Ethnography Forum. I went to a session. The title of the session was, What Do Chinese Immigrant Students Really Think About No Child Left Behind? And it was um, organized by one of our doctoral students in reading, writing, literacy, Mary Yi, who's worked for many years with the school district of Philadelphia. And then there was a, a teacher from a Chinese bilingual program and three students. And they started the session by passing out a short quiz to us in the audience. Well, the quiz was totally written in Chinese. It was a multiple choice questions. And first he passed it out and the teacher and said, um, he was speaking in English at that point. No, no, I think maybe he was speaking in Chinese at that point. And so he passed it out, and we're all sitting there, you know, like, we could tell that it was a quiz, but there were no Chinese speakers in the audience. And at some point, I said, teacher, I don't understand. <laughs> so then he said in English, I can read the questions for you in English. So he was, in other words, he modeled the whole process of a standardized test with accommodations that, that No Child Left Behind permits. Normally it would be in English for Chinese speakers, but he did it in Chinese for English speakers. And I can tell you, I love to do well at tests. I was so frustrated. I really wanted to, you know, answer those questions. I couldn't. I couldn't understand what he was saying. Now, that seems like such a silly example in a way, but when you really think about it and what we're subjecting kids to then, what an impediment to learning that is. The Penn GSE EdCast is a production of the University of Pennsylvania's Graduate School of Education. It's produced by me with editorial assistance from John Wallace and technical direction from Kaja Novotsky. For more about Nancy's work, you can visit our website, www.gse.upenn.edu. Thanks for downloading. See you next time.